Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I am uh, pleased um, to be here. I'd like to thank Anthony, who's not here today, um, to come back and to, um, to uh, come to one of my homes here, the men's group at the Curie of Arts, to talk to you about a subject that's very interesting for me, um, and it's in my background. Um, a little background on myself for those of you who don't know me. My name is Charles Malu. I'm a graduate of Ave Maria School of Law in the class of 2005. I'm from Long Island. I went to St. Anthony's. Um, I've spent time working in the public sector. I've volunteered for uh, people in government, for campaigns, things like that. Currently, I work for a trial firm, a litigation firm in Westbury, New York, and I try cases. Um, this is a nice opportunity for me because I get to talk about something that is somewhat of a passion. You know, Figuring out which car ran the red light day in and day out, um, or which person who's suing for money is trying to defraud someone else, that's exciting, but this is more of a passion. So I'm really excited to be here to be able to share that with you guys and to talk about policy. And also to be able to combine not only the Obamacare decision, but a little bit about what our charge is and when we look at ourselves as Catholics, when we look at the mission that we have. Currently, I've been spending my time um, as, as a member of a group, a founding member of a group called the Catholic Ministry Team, which is assembling lay artists and individuals who are committed to being members of the church in the world. And we need good people who are in the church, who are attorneys, who are um, carpenters, who work in stores. We need to be out there and being a part of that. And so this kind of fits in with my role in that regard as well. Now, Anthony told me, I asked him what he wanted, and he said he wanted me to give a very inspiring talk to like rev you guys up, to get you into what's going on. And coming from him and following him, for anyone who knows him, you know, it's such a big shoes to follow. He's such a great motivational speaker. I think sometimes like Anthony could maybe motivate Lady Gaga to wear clothes, like if she, <laughs> if she like sat in on one of his talks. So I, I have big shoes to fill, I have a big task. But I'd like to talk about, um, primarily we're going to talk about National Federation of Independent Businesses Against Sebelius. That's the long name for the Obamacare decision. And if there's one thing that I can impart on each and every one of you listening to this tonight as we talk about this, it's this, and this very important point, and it's that each and every one of you matter, right? Every year in an election cycle, we hear they're all the same, it doesn't matter what I do, it doesn't matter what I vote for. I'm just kind of one of the, one of the people and everything's so big, government's so big, um, society's so big, what does my voice count? This decision affirms the importance of each and every one of you and the duty and task and mission that we all have to be a part of what's going on in the world. I want to read to you um, one of uh, the early parts of Judge Justice Roberts' decision, and I'm going to go through a little bit of the law in a little bit, but this, I think, says everything you need to know when he's talking about the decision. Justice Roberts said, proper respect for... Well, that's emphasis, right? Um, it wasn't on anyway, so... Um, proper respect for um, the coordinate... Uh, branches of government requires that we strike down an act of Congress only if they lack the constitutional authority to pass the act in question, if that's clearly demonstrated. And Roberts explains what the role of the Supreme Court is. A lot of people think you just go to the court if you're not happy, but he says members of this court are vested with the authority to interpret the law. We possess neither the expertise nor the prerogative to make policy judgments. Those decisions are entrusted to our nation's elected leaders who can be thrown out of office if the people disagree with them. It is not our job to protect the people from the consequences of their political choices. Wow, those are big words from Chief Justice Roberts, right? I wanna read that to you again. It is not our job to protect the people from the consequences of their political choices. When you vote, when you choose not to vote, when you choose not to inform yourself on who to vote for, he's saying don't complain. That's your choice. You've made your bed, you now have to sleep in it. And he's saying this because a lot of people say, well, go to the courts, go to the courts. And there's this big idea, you go to the court, everything goes to the court. 
He said, this isn't our job. Our job is to determine is the law constitutional or not. If you don't like it, that's not our job to change it. And what my reading of that, what I'm implying that he's saying in there, he's saying, look, this law is awful. But just because it's an awful law doesn't mean that we just overturn it. We have to have a constitutional basis. Um, when we think about that as one of the charges and challenges of democracy, right? If we want to participate in a democracy, if we want to truly be free, what we need is the ability to make the wrong decision. Because if we don't have that ability, then we're not free. And if we have the ability to make the wrong decision, that gives a huge responsibility to the people who know how to make the right decision to make that decision. Sir George Corn Cornwall once said, government is a very tough business. You must be content with unsatisfactory results. And look at this, 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 this law, I think, falls under that, that finding. Um, now, Roberts gives you what you have to do. You've got to answer the call to action, okay? And he's telling you, and he's telling me, and he's telling everyone we know that we have a challenge to go out, and if we don't like it, to do something about it. The question is, do you accept that challenge? And I want to talk about this decision in three parts. I want to talk about, number one, how we got here. I think it's very important to understand how this law was passed culturally. I want to talk about the decision itself. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the technical stuff without getting too legalistic. And then where do we go from here? And especially where do we go from here, looking at some of the things that are facing Catholics who have questions about what does this law for me, mean for me as a Catholic. Now, when we look at how this law happened, we have to look at two very important election years, 2006 and 2008. And in 2006 and in 2008, we saw a tremendous turn of a tide. We had, we'll call it Bush fatigue, or we'll call it war fatigue, or whatever fatigue you want to call it, the country was fatigued, and they wanted something different. And by the time the, um, the 2006 and 2008 elections were over, you had, for the most part, a supermajority in Congress. Um, President Obama won the 2008 election with 52.9% of the vote to McCain's 45.7% of the vote. He won the Electoral College 365 to 173. At the end of the, um, the 2008 election, the Democrats had increased their membership in the House of Representatives in 21 seats and 8 seats in the Senate. And that was after a 2006 election where they had tremendous gains, right? So what we had was a government that was responding to six years of fatigue, of people who wanted something different, and it put pretty much one party in complete power. And they had such a majority that it gave the opportunity for them to do pretty much whatever it is that they wanted to do. And if we looked at the polling, and I'm not going to go into some of the polling from that time period, you saw a trend away from 2002 and 2004 and security and the war and how do we keep ourselves safe to domestic issues, gas prices, health care, things like that, education, right? And the polling at that time was favoring the Democrats. Um, looking at real clear politics, they were looking at different polling numbers and they said the Democrats enjoyed a lead greater than their overall 11 uh, point advantage among voters who choose health care and education as their top issue, right? So the seeds were being sown. It was available to anyone who was paying attention. There was a tide. There was a swell in the country. And it was favoring one party. And that party had come into power. And they were talking about electoral strategies. And the Democrats really decided to emphasize those things um, in terms of their strategy. What did the Republicans do in response to that? Well, they wanted to go back to the well. They were in power in 06 and they wanted to be reelected, And they had gone to the well with security issues and threats and things like that. And that stuff is all well and good. But I want to read to you uh, uh, an excerpt from the Washington Post. This is, from, uh, this is from 2006. It says, Congress will return to Washington this week with the Republican majorities in both chambers at risk and GOP leaders planning to turn the floors of the House and Senate into battlegrounds over which political party can best protect the country from terrorists and other security threats. But in devoting the few remaining legislative days almost exclusively to security issues, 
Republicans will leave major domestic tasks undone, including President Bush's prized immigration overhaul and long-promised legislation to tougher restrictions on lobbying and the corruption scandals. No budget plan will be completed. Promised relief for seniors struggling with their Medicaid prescription drug plans will have to wait. As many as eight of the 11 bills needed to fund the government will not be passed before the November of 2006 elections. So there was a political, strategic decision. Instead of bringing up votes on some of the issues that were really beginning to gain traction, the domestic issues, for political reasons, they didn't want to address that, and they wanted to address what their strengths were. And that, that can be smart politics, or it couldn't be. It turned out not to be for them, because they weren't listening to what the people were asking for. The people were really beginning to worry about health care costs. They were beginning to worry about gas prices. They were worrying about their bank account savings. There was a real beginning change in the culture of what was going on. Now, um, when we look at that election and when we look at uh, what was happening, um, we had articles about that. Um, and we had, I want to read to you a portion of a USA Today article. Um, by Richard Benedetto, where he's talking about health care costs for the 2008 election, right? So we're talking about 2006, we know what happened, right? And now we're looking into 2008. And he said, with health care costs soaring and millions of baby boomers about to go on Medicare, health care, and how to pay for it, okay, um, um, emerges as the top domestic issue in the 2008 presidential campaign. The nation's capital is buzzing with health care talking proposals for change. Meanwhile, other members of Congress facing re-election this year are raising their voices about the need to overhaul the health system and avert a crisis. But so far, they've done little more than to pay lip service to the concept. They know few solutions are painless. Read that again. They know few solutions are painless, and they know voters are unwilling to tolerate changes that would increase costs or reduce services. Tommy Thompson, uh, President Bush's former Health and Human Services Secretary, told the AARP con conference, I would dare to say that the 2008 presidential election is going to be all about health care, right? This is an article in 2006 pre predicting what the 2008 election would be about, and that it would all be about health care. And let's look at the candidates' platforms. President Obama's platform in 2008 is still up on CNN.com. They got an election page. You can go there, you can see it for yourself. See if this sounds familiar to you. Would create a national health insurance program for individuals who do not have employer-provided health care and who do not qualify for other existing federal programs. Now this is interesting because this platform at the time said this, does not mandate individual coverage for all Americans. So he went back on something in his platform. But the seeds were there. Um, says requires all coverage for children. He noted that regarding employer contributions to health care, the Obama website states employers that do not offer or make meaningful contributions to the cost of quality health care coverage for their employees will be required to contribute a percentage of payroll towards the costs of the national plan. In 2008, on President Obama's, then Senator Obama's campaign website, the framework for the bill that was passed was staring us right in the faces, right? There should be no mystery how this happened. It was right there. And when you give them a Congress with a supermajority, it should be no surprise that that plan's gonna go through, right? And we talked about the percentages of the vote, and we talked about how the Democrats won big over two years. They, they listened to the call, right? And when we look at things, sometimes we divide things up in terms of you know, Catholic faith, and there are issues that are important, and not all issues are the same. Some issues have more importance, some don't. But definitely the call to answer challenges for health care and stuff that people are struggling with was a need that wasn't being met, that needed to be met. And there was a void, and they drove a Mack truck right through it in 2009. So, we have the passage of what was called the Affordable Health Care Act, commonly known as Obamacare, in 2009. Now, Let's look at the result of that. Now, what we're looking at, first of all, when we look at the act, one of the, the one legal issue I want to talk about that I think is significant and interesting for us to learn about within the decision without getting too technical is the idea of this Commerce Clause power. 
And just real briefly, in the Constitution, Article 3 of the Constitution um, uh, gives the judicial power to the Supreme Court, okay? And the Supreme Court has nine justices. Actually, a little trivia for you. The Constitution doesn't say how many justices you have to have. Just tradition over time has led us to have nine justices, right? And when we look at these challenges, right, so we look at, we're going to look at this Commerce Clause issue and in the Obamacare decision. When we look at these challenges on the basis of constitutionalness, when a case goes before the Supreme Court, each judge has the right to either write their own opinion or join in an opinion of another judge, okay? And what we as attorneys have to do is we read all the opinions and say, well, gee, these five agree on this issue, so this is the law. These five don't agree on this issue, so this isn't the law. And it's kind of like putting together a puzzle. When we read other things, it's kind of like, well, question and answer, and the answer's in bold. And it's not like that. In fact, there's one case, I forget the name of it, where each of the nine justices wrote a separate opinion. And you had to read all nine of the opinions and figure out, like, well, what's the answer? Was the law upheld or was it struck down, right? So... When we look at the way the Supreme Court is set up, they're basically set up to give these opinions as to what's going on, um, and to figure, and we've got to figure out what's happening in, in the subcontext. And when we get into these issues and what the legal challenges, and when we look at this this issue, the best explanation of the Obamacare bill and what it could mean for you going forward, and what we're going to see comes from Justice Roberts. He um, basically gives a nice overview in the beginning of this decision. And the decision, by the way, the Obamacare decision, if you ever are inclined to read it, it's 193 pages. It's very exciting. I'm sure uh, you would all uh, be kept riveted awake understanding it. But he's got a couple of things that, that he says. He says, so you want to understand what the, the law is? Here's the law. In 2010, Congress enacted the patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. The act aims to increase the number of Americans covered by health insurance and decrease the cost of health care. The act's 10 titles stretch over 900 pages and contain hundreds of provisions. This case concerns constitutional challenges to two key provisions, commonly uh, referred to as the individual mandate and the Medicaid expansion. The individual mandate requires that most Americans maintain minimum essential health insurance coverage. The mandate does not apply to some individuals, such as prisoners and undocumented aliens. Many individuals will receive the required coverage through their employer or from a government program such as Medicaid or Medicare. But individuals who are not exempt and do not receive health insurance through a third party, um, um, oh, but for individuals who are not exempt and do not receive health insurance through a third party, the means of satisfying the requirement is to purchase insurance from a private company. Beginning in 2014, so it hasn't begun yet, those who do not comply with the mandate must make a shared responsibility payment okay, to the federal government. That payment, which the Act describes as a penalty, is calculated as a percentage of the household income subject to a floor based on a specific dollar amount and a ceiling based on the average annual premium the individual would have to pay if he was paying for private health care insurance. In 2016, Judge Justice Roberts gives you an example, the penalty will be 2.5% of an individual's household income, but no less than $695 and no more than the average yearly premium for insurance that covers 60% of the cost of 10 specified services. So it's very technical. But what Justice Roberts is telling us here is that once this thing kicks in in 2014, if you don't have health care insurance, right, all right, you either pay a penalty with a floor of $695, or you'll pay the highest number, which would be the average premium you'd have to pay if you had private insurance. Why is this important? Okay. Well, one of the things that um, I'm not going to go into in depth, one of the key features of the law, and I think this is a good feature, actually, if you can work it in terms of sustainability, is the law does away with restrictions on people looking for care for pre-existing conditions, right? So if you don't have to have insurance to get health care, right, if pre-existing conditions no longer are a bar to you getting coverage, where's the incentive to buy insurance? 
there's now an incentivization not to buy insurance, right? So now what the government is saying, well, if you're not going to buy insurance, now you have this incentive not to buy insurance. You could break your leg, buy your insurance, and then go to the hospital after that. We're going to penalize you if you want to live life like that. And a lot of the debates, if you listen to the oral arguments between the justices, were over this question of what would young people do? And some of the justices were questioning the attorneys from the government and said, come on, young people aren't going to buy insurance if they don't have to, right? So this whole issue with the penalty is because now there's an incentive for people not to buy insurance. You don't have to. Now, the Act provides that the penalty will pay to who? Our friend, the Internal Revenue Service, the IRS, right? So willing to help out. They're going to just jump in. They're going to collect the payments. Very generous of them. And it, but, and this is a key provision, and this comes into one of the reasons why the law was upheld, which I'm not going to get into too much. It bars the IRS from using several of its normal enforcement tools, such as criminal prosecution and levies. So if you don't pay the penalty, they can't haul you off to jail. Okay. And they can't levy you either? That, well, that's what that's just Roberts is saying, right? So, but you're still going to have the penalty, right? And it's still going to... They're gonna they're gonna find a way to make it difficult for you. They may very well do that, and that's stuff that will get worked out once things kick in in 2014. And we're gonna talk a little bit about regulating it. Um, that's where changes are gonna come in, and they're gonna if they're gonna advance how they're gonna do it with stuff that's not in the direct law. Um, now. Some of them are, some people are exempt from the mandate, um, and those are some small, very small groups. Um, so I want to talk about the individual mandate. And this mandate requiring you to pay was justified under this Commerce Clause understanding. And in Article 1 of the Constitution, Section 8, we have this Commerce Clause, where when the Constitution was ratified, it says that Congress shall have the power to regulate commerce with the foreign nations and among the several states and with Indian tribes. That Commerce Clause power has been used to justify the expansion of federal government power over the last hundred years, okay? And they use that Commerce <coughs> Clause power to justify this mandate, right? Right. So they're saying, look, we're going to put this mandate, we're going to require and compel you and you and you to buy insurance, okay? And we can do it because we can do it under the Commerce Clause. And there's a case that I want to tell you about, which you might get a kick out of, that sort of gives credence to this. It's a case called Wickard v. v. Filburn, which is a case from the 1940s. We got this guy out in Ohio. His name is Roscoe. Roscoe Filburn, right? It's a real Ohio name, right? Roscoe, right? And he had planted 23 acres of wheat on his own property, and he harvested 462 bushels, okay? Now, what was happening at that time period? The Great Depression. And what was happening that was a problem? Wheat prices were fluctuating. So the government had enacted the Agricultural Adjustment Act, where the government could tell farmers how much wheat to produce. And if you produce too little wheat, you were regulated. If you produce too much wheat, you were penalized. So, Roscoe produces these 462 bushels. 239 more bushels than he was allowed to under the Agricultural Act, right? The government finds out about this and they penalize him. And he says to the government, look, all of these bushels, all this wheat I'm making is on my property and is for my own personal use. It's just for me. You can't come after me, right? Leave me alone. It's my wheat, okay? Roscoe sued the government, telling them they had no right to tell him what to do. The case goes all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court found, and I'm going to paraphrase this, they said that if Roscoe decided not to grow his own wheat, he would then have to buy wheat on the market. Brilliant. The Supreme Court, the highest court in the land, brilliant that they could come up with that conclusion. And they said that if Roscoe had to buy wheat from someone else, then that would affect commerce. And the Supreme Court went on to state that if everyone decided to grow their own wheat, then they wouldn't have to buy wheat. And that would have a really bad effect on interstate commerce. So on the basis that if everyone just grew their own wheat and stopped buying, 
Roscoe now becomes a threat. So the government said, we can regulate you because if everyone else did what you were doing, that would affect interstate commerce. Um, by analogy, and I, I, I really wanted to use this analogy, but well, you'll have to talk about this. Let's say that Anthony Gentile decided that he was just going to make statues in his own home, right, for his own use, right? That logic, the government could say, no, we can regulate how many statues you make in your own home for your own use, because by making a statue in your own home, you're not buying it on the market, right? So the government basically has used that power in the 40s to go into all sorts of other areas of life. The federal government was not set up to police you. That's the state governments and the county governments. But the Commerce Clause has been used to, to, to tell people basically how to run themselves. When was that? That was 1942 was that decision. So what then happens is the government, in this case, National Federation of Independent Businesses, uses that justification to say, this is why this law and this mandate telling you that you have to buy insurance, this is unheard of, that you have to buy something is constitutional because you know what? You're all going to be affected by health care at some point in time, and if you don't do it, that's going to affect everyone else. Now, what Justice Roberts does is he addresses that in his opinion. And in terms of understanding government and law and government expansion of power, this becomes important. And he says that he rejects pretty much that argument for the purposes of this case. He says, if you use the government's logic that would justify a mandatory purchase of a product to solve almost any problem, right? So when you read this decision, right, what Justice Roberts concludes, okay, with the four dissenters, Scalia and Thomas and Alito and um, uh, Kennedy, is that when you take this argument that the Commerce Clause justifies and gives the government the ability to tell you you've got to purchase something, they throw that argument out. That is very important, okay? Because what that does is that puts a limit on what the government's going to be able to do going forward. If the Supreme Court came out and said, five justices to four, that the government is empowered by the Constitution under the Commerce Clause to compel you to buy something because it could affect interstate commerce, it would have opened the door to a wide range of regulations, actions that you have to do under the basis of this could affect interstate commerce. And what do we know about society today? And what do we know about the world today? It's all interconnected. It's all interconnected through computers, through the internet. Everything travels interstate. So you could make a justification on the basis of the Commerce Clause to regulate anything. So the fact that they said no, that's important. But the law still stood. Why did the law still stand? Well, Justice Roberts looked at the law and he basically said, and if you want to ask about this, I'm going to leave some time for questions um, about sort of, you get into, especially in election year, you'll hear candidates and they'll talk about judicial activism and who interprets the Constitution and everything like that. What I think Justice Roberts does is he puts out a plan to say, as a Supreme Court, when we review a law, this is what we need to, to look at, right? And he says it's pretty much our job to look at every possible reason to keep this thing alive. We can't just go in and say, you know what, we want to take this law out. Why? Because like I told you at the beginning of the talk, the court is not responsible for protecting the people from the consequences of their political choices. So he looks at this, he says, look, the penalty isn't crazy, okay? And he says, they're not putting you in jail. And he says, it's collected by the IRS. So you know what? It looks like a tax to me. And if this is a tax, we cannot say it's unconstitutional. We might not like it. And when you read his opinion, I don't think he's a fan of the law. But he said we have no basis for calling it unconstitutional. right? And he looks at it, and he goes through the penalty, and he looks at everything. So when we look at the decision itself, the two things that we want to take out of the decision, in terms of the mandate, are number one, the mandate can't be justified under the basis that your actions might affect commerce between the states. That argument's out, okay? The government can't tell you that you gotta purchase something because maybe you might affect something else, right? But that the court isn't gonna jump in and save you from a mistake. They've gotta look at every reason to keep the law intact. And why is that? Well, I think that gives balance to a democracy. 
We have to have a reasonable expectation that if we elect individuals to run the government, that what we elect will happen, right? And if you have a couple of people just knocking things out left and right, that's not good. That's chaos, right? Now, briefly, there's a Medicaid portion of it where the government basically said in the Obamacare, you hear about the Medicaid portion, you, Medicaid is something that's administered by the states. The states receive money from the federal government to administer programs to people under Medicaid, okay? The government administers. It's complex. It's pages and pages of red tape, people getting harassed, phone calls, payments this, submit that, paperwork, drives everyone crazy, right? But what happened was the states were receiving a ton of money from the federal government to implement these Medicaid programs. And what part of the Obamacare decision was, was they wanted to restructure how the states did certain programs and provided extra services. And the, Obama, the law basically said, look, we want you to do X, Y, and Z, okay, in addition to what you're doing. And if you do X, Y, and Z, we're going to give you all this extra money to do it. But if you don't want to do it, not only are we not going to give you this extra money, but we're going to take away the money we've been giving you, okay. Um, the court basically said that that's a no-go, right? That's a no-go. You can't do that. Because the states have been relying on this money from the government to administer these programs. So they basically said you can't, it's essentially coercion. It's kind of not the exciting uh, topic in the news, like for individuals, but it is definitely something that's re really interesting in terms of how the government can coerce a state. The courts say, no, you can't coerce a state. So. The law is alive and well. It's existing. In 2014, the shared responsibility payment is going to kick into effect. And the law is beginning to kick into effect in other ways. So where does that leave us? Okay. Now, let's look at this from a Catholic perspective. And I want to talk a little bit about this mandate that went into effect yesterday that's all over the news. People don't sometimes understand how it comes together. And before we get to that, let's look at some initial responses from Catholic organizations about this law. The Catholic Medical Association issued a statement after the decision came down. The Catholic Medical Association is disturbed and disappointed that the Supreme Court saw fit to uphold Obamacare. This decision is both alarming and deeply wrong. With an abortion premium built into many health insurance plans, Obamacare makes every taxpayer an accessory to elective abortion. With the mandate from HHS forcing all health insurance plans to subsidize abortion-causing pills, contraceptives, and sterilization for women, Obamacare holds our health insurance hostage, either comply and abandon our religious beliefs, or resist and be fined for our faith. Even apart from attacks on human life and religious freedom, Obamacare puts too much power in the hands of the federal government. It will increase the cost and decrease the quality of health care. Rather than follow the extreme and unconstitutional path of Obamacare, we need a measured and responsible approach to health care reform. The Catholic Medical Association will work to achieve authentic health care reform in 2013 and beyond. Okay. That's the Catholic Medical Association's response. Um, Catholic Online had an article which pretty much echoes the same types of things. The bishops kind of echoed that. A lot of strong words were said after this. And this is kind of where we get in some of the questions when we're talking about how are they going to make sure you pay the mandate? How does this HHS thing happen? This goes into the functions of how government works. Okay? And this is how messed up the whole system of government is. Because this is what happens. You go into the election booth in November, and you look between Tom Smith and Bob Peterson, right? And you say, you know what? I'm going to vote for so-and-so because I think this candidate is the best for the country and, and espouses my values, does all this stuff, right? That guy goes to Congress and they're going to write a law. And what they're going to do is they're going to say, the law is going to provide health care. We're going to have Obamacare. And what happens, right? Whenever they write a law, especially the more controversial ones, what congressmen do is they don't write everything about the law in the law. It's the dirty little secret. They either create an agency to administer the law, or they tell an existing agency to administer the law. In this case, Obamacare is being administered by the Department for Health and Human Services. 
So what happens is the law sets out these general principles and there are gaps in both how the law is going to be enforced and what provisions they may have forgotten or maybe things that they didn't think about. And the law then empowers an agency or a department to fill in those gaps. And the first example of this that we have is with this mandate that's come out that everyone's talking about that went into effect yesterday from the Department of Health and Human Services. Okay. So basically the Department of Health and Human Services uh, comes out with this um, this mandate, and I want to be clear on how this is intertwined, okay, with the Obamacare decision itself. Had the Supreme Court thrown out the whole Obamacare law, the HHS mandate is gone. The only reason why the government is empowered to tell insure, uh, private institutions what types of insurance they have to provide for their employees is because it's authorized in the Obamacare law itself. Right? So we have to understand that if the law got thrown out, the mandate is gone. But because the law stands, now we've got to look at this mandate and what's going on with it. The rule um, requires all employers to offer free access to contraception, sterilization, and potentially abortion-inducing drugs. Now, that becomes a debate because some people will tell you, oh, no, no, no these drugs don't produce abortion. But if you look into the, the science and the medicine of it, a lot of these drugs, the morning after pills, even con some contraceptive pills, are just concentrated, concentrated doses of chemicals and hormones that cause whatever's in the woman's body to leave, right? So if something's fertilized under these pills, it could be discharged, and that's an abortion, right? And there's a dispute as to whether or not all of these things are abortion-inducing or not, right? So sometimes the government will try to say, look, it doesn't know, it, they, these don't induce abortion, but there's a real medical dispute about that, right? But these things are now required to be provided to all employees and paid for by the companies in their healthcare plans. The government, interestingly enough, describes these items as preventative services. Okay, contraception, potentially abortion-inducing drugs, and sterilization as preventative services. Healthcare.gov is the website that is maintained by the government if you want to see what's happening in the Department of Health and Human Services. They said with regard to these procedures, family planning services are an essential preventative service for women and critical and, uh, to appropriately spacing and ensuring intended pregnancies, which results in improved maternal health and birth and better birth outcomes. The government looks at these things as preventative services, and if you look at the Federal Register, um, when they talk about the regulation, it says this as follows. The guidelines recover, require coverage without cost, okay, sharing uh, for all FDA-approved contraceptive methods, sterilization procedures, and patient education and counseling for all women with reproductive capacity as prescribed by a provider. Now these recommendations come from an agency called the uh, Institute of Medicine, which is a government-funded agency who makes recommendations for different healthcare procedures and laws and whatnot. And the Institute of Medicine um, defined women who are of reproductive capacity for the purposes of these laws as being women as young as 15 years old, right? So what this mandate is saying is in addition to re requiring insurers and companies and employers to cover contraceptive, they're requiring elective sterilization procedures for teenagers as a part of this law. And they're saying, Catholic Church, you've got to pay for it. Joe Catholic, who has a business and self-insures the business, you've got to pay for it. Um, the Institute of Medicine said a wide array of safe and highly effective FDA-approved methods of contraception are available. Um, they talk about sterilization. Um, they said that you know, things depend on people's life practices. They described sterilization as being a surgical procedure. They talked about some things as not being surgical procedures. And they're saying that this is what we have to pay for. So when we look at them being intertwined, we've got to... You've got to see that 
We don't even know what's going to come in the future because we don't know what regulations are going to come from the Department of Health and, and Human Services in the future, right? We don't know what regulations are going to come from the IRS about how to maintain the shared responsibility payment. And when we look at a glimpse in the future, I want to read an article, I hope it's not too long, that it was just being circulated, uh, it's dated July 30th, it was on CNS News, with regard to this mandate and Obamacare and private businesses. Now, when we try to figure out, well, the Catholic Church is upset because they don't want to pay for it, they have employees, right? And that's a big religious liberty issue, right? But it's not just the church. It's individuals who have objections to these things on the basis of their moral beliefs, right? And this article is about a small business owner in Colorado. Um, and it's actually the Newland family. And they own Hercules Industries. It's a heating and ventilation air conditioning business. Um, the Justice Department filed um, against them, um, or I should, say, I should say, let's go back one second. The Newland family founded Hercules in 1962 and have maintained it as a family-owned business ever since then. They now employ 265 people. They are challenging, um, they're filing a lawsuit challenging the regulation, the HHS regulation, which would require virtually all health insurance plans to cover without cost sharing, sterilizations, approved contraceptives, and drugs that could possibly induce abortions. Under the Obamacare law, businesses that have more than 50 employees must provide health insurance to their employees or face a penalty. To satisfy the mandate, the insurance must include the cost-sharing free sterilization, contraception, abortifacient uh, benefit. The regulation takes effect yesterday, which means that as soon as any business starts a new plan for the year, its health insurance program after that date must comply with the HHS rule. Right? So you're seeing stuff in the media and the news about whether or not businesses and groups will comply with that. The Catholic Church, to which the Newlands belong, teaches that sterilization, contraception, and abortion are intrinsically immoral. The Catholic bishops adopted a statement calling the regulation unjust and illegal and a violation of personal civil rights. <coughs> and while much of the media attention on the regulation is focused on the fact that it will apply to institutions, it also applies... Um, to um, businesses that are run by lay people, right? And it also includes employees who will be forced to pay insurance premiums on insurance plans that violate the teachings of their faith and business owners who have to provide those plans. The Catholic bishops declared that the regulation created a class of Americans with no conscience protection at all. Individuals who in their daily lives strive to constantly act in accordance with their faith and moral values. They too face a government mandate to aid and provide services contrary to those values, whether in their sponsoring of and payment for insurance as employers, their payment of insurance premiums as employees, or as insurers themselves, without even the semblance of an exemption. Going back to the Newlands, the Newlands currently run a self-insurance plan. They provide all 265 of their employees with insurance. They're self-insured. And they provide their employees with a generous health care coverage that is consistent with the teachings of the Catholic Church, does not cover sterilizations, contraceptions, or abortifacient drugs. They are precisely among the class of people that the Catholic bishops said have no conscience protection at all due to this regulation. <coughs> the Newlands complaint against the administration uh, explains that they could not comply with the regulation without violating their religious faith. The Newlands sincerely believe that the Catholic faith does not allow them to violate Catholic religious and moral teachings in their decisions in operating Hercules Industries, says the complaint. They believe that according to the Catholic faith, their operation of Hercules must be guided by ethical and social principles and Catholic religious and moral teachings that adhere uh, and the adherence of their business practices to such Catholic ethics and religious and moral teachings and that that is their genuine calling from God that their faith prohibits them to sever their religious beliefs from their daily business practice, and that their faith requires them to integrate the gifts of the spiritual life, the virtues, morals, and ethical social principles of Catholic teaching into their life and work. We talk about integrating faith into our lay lives, 
They're trying to live it. And they've taken a stand. The Catholic Church teaches that abortifacient drugs, contraception, and sterilization are an intrinsic evil, says the complaint. As a matter of religious faith, the Newlands believe that those Catholic teachings are among the religious, ethical teachings they must follow throughout their lives, including in their business practice. So how does the government respond to that? Right? We ready? We want to get see the government's response. The Justice Department responded by arguing that if the Newlands Roman Catholic faith prevented them from following the Obama administration's command that they provide employees with cost-sharing free coverage for sterilization, contraception, and abortion-inducing drugs, that the Newlands could simply give up their business entirely. That's the government's response. The Justice Department. The Justice Department further argued that people owing, owning for-profit secular businesses do not have a First Amendment right to the free exercise of religion in the way they conduct their businesses, particularly if the business is incorporated. Right. So the government responds and says, number one, if you don't like it. And they're kind of taunting them. If your faith is so important to you that this is a problem, all right, put up or shut up. Give up your business. That's what the government's saying. And saying, number two, you know what? We don't even think you have a First Amendment right to incorporate your religious beliefs into your business. The article goes on to state, um, the Justice Department states, here the plaintiffs, that would be the Newlands, have not sufficiently alleged that the presented services coverage regulations substantially burden their religious exercise. The Justice Department told the court that Hercules Industries is not a religious employer, it's an HVAC manufacturer. Okay, it's an air conditioned manufacturer. So they're saying, look, you're not a church. What's the big deal? The First Amendment complaint does not allege that the company is affiliated with a formerly religious entity such as the church, the Justice Department told the court. Nor does it allege that the company employs persons of a particular faith. In short, Hercules Industries is plainly a for-profit secular employer. So the government's saying, if you're in the secular world, check your faith at the door. Okay. Um, by definition, the Justice Department claimed a secular employer does not engage in any exercise of religion. Okay. So they go through the religious beliefs, and they're talking this, about... This is the... Like, this is what this is going on right now. This is a lawsuit that was filed just right now. This business to the Supreme Court, or it's a, you start in the lower courts and you work courts. your way up. And this business is saying we're not going to comply with this. And the government's saying, listen, if you want to be in the secular world, you forfeit your right to religious liberty. Now, let's look at the practicalities. Okay. They can bring, come down with a rule again, right? I'll talk about that in a second. I'll talk about that in a second. Because there's, there's more to be excited about, right? I hope so. If they refuse to sell their business, families like the Newlands are trapped by the regulation. They can stop providing health insurance to themselves and their employees through the business. But if they stop providing health insurance, then what happens? Then they and their employees are still required, because of the individual mandate, to buy health insurance. And because the regulation mandates that all insurance policies cover these things that they find objectionable, they're going to have to pay for a plan that covers the things that they're trying to avoid by having their own plan, which doesn't cover them, right? The premiums would contribute to those services, right? Now, if they choose not to do this, they've got to pay a penalty, okay? So what's the penalty? The penalty is they would be fined if they do not comply with this mandate $100 per employee per day. With 265 employees, a business like the Newlands would need to pay the government $26,500 per day if they decided not to comply with the mandate. Over 365 days, that would amount to $9 million Six hundred and seventy-two thousand dollars. Sounds like they want to pay for the deficit as a penalty, right? Now, so 
That is being litigated right now. There was an injunction filed. It's being litigated in Colorado. Um, I believe, I believe if that's the case, there was a case where a judge came down and sided in favor of the business. But that's temporary because the thing is going to be litigated all its way up. But that's what happens. That regulation, the HHS mandate, wasn't in the Obamacare law when they were voting on it. Could you imagine the backlash of the Catholic Church if all employers were required to cover those things as a part of the law when they were voting on it? That's why they didn't put it in. And they left it for the department to put it in afterwards because they can give a regulation. So we don't know what the future is going to hold. So what does this mean for us? Well, I'm going to start from a Catholic perspective, okay? And I want to look at some exit polling from some elections to get an idea of what's happening in the country. In 1992, the Catholic vote broke down like this. Bill Clinton, 44%. H.W. Bush, 35%. Perot, 20%. In 1996, the Catholic vote broke down like this. Bill Clinton, 53%. Bob Dole, 37%. Perot, 9%. In the 2000 presidential election, the Catholic vote broke down like this. Gore, 53%. Bush, 46%. In the 2004 presidential election, the Catholic vote broke down like this. Bush, 52%. Kerry, 47%. In the 2008 presidential election, the Catholic vote broke down like this. Obama, 54%. McCain, 45%. In fact, let's look at congressional elections. In 2006, the national congressional poll, Catholics voted Democrats, 55%. Republicans, 44%. In the 2012 National, I mean, 2010, National Congressional Exit Poll, Republicans, 54%, Democrats, 44%. Why did it go through those things for Catholic votes? Did you see a trend? The Catholics voted with the winner every time. Now, 2000, Bush won, but Gore won the popular vote. The Catholic vote has voted with the winner, 1992, 1996, 2000, 2004, 2006, 2008, 2010. Polls aren't that accurate, though. That's exit polling. That's, and there's facts. a science to it. Those aren't polls, those are facts. These are the exit polling. This is after you people ready? vote. Exit polling, for anyone who doesn't know, exit polling, you go in, after you vote, they hand you a sheet. You answer 20 to 50 questions, depending on the election, saying, why did you vote the way you voted? And they're people who actually voted. And they take a sample size that they believe to be scientifically accurate, so they can say, this is how men voted. This is how women voted. What does it mean? Does it mean that Catholics just are good at picking the winner? Maybe. But I think it means something else. I think it means that if Catholics were to decide that we want to influence an election, they can. Right? Let's look at this. It's also saying that your Supreme Court judge can turn around with the HHS mandate and say you voted for him in. Well, and deal with it. But that's but that's the system of government. That's no, what our constitution saying, yes. is. It's not the Supreme Court's job to come up with that, right? No, I know. I'm if we saying. look at these elections, right? The elections, the Catholic vote is between 23 to 27 percent of the overall vote, right? That's a huge chunk of a voting population. There's a chance that if Catholics voted as Catholics that things could change. And that goes in both parties. And I don't, I'm not going to come across partisan either way for the purposes of this talk. Look, there needs to be pro-life Democrats. They need to be there, right? If all the Catholic Democrats voted only for pro-life Democrats, that would change the Democratic Party and it would change the issue. Republicans need to address needs for people in their everyday lives. They need to have a plan for health care. They need to have a plan for job safety and security. And if they made that an emphasis in how they voted in primaries, that would change those candidates. It's not confined to one party. There's an article in The Political, which is one of my favorite websites, because I'm a political junkie, right? And it was titled two days ago, The GOP may let the contraceptive rule take effect without a fight. It goes on to say, this spring, Republicans are on a mission, we're on a mission, repeal the HHS rule, right? But it says that, now, with the rule set to take effect, the rhetoric has fizzled. The people who are all about appealing it, they've gone quiet, right? And I want you to listen to this, because I'm going to go off on a little side tangent. What looked like an initial rallying cry changed, because the left 
dubbed this opposition the Republicans' war on women, right? The PR got tough for them, and they backed out, right? People got tired of saying, we have a problem with this, and they got quiet. There's no incentive. So now, when we need people to stand up for what's going on for religious liberty, they're backing down. And we got to be very careful when we talk about our charge and our mission. You know, in terms of this specific thing, this is not a war on women. And we should never accept someone dubbing it that, ever. And we have to be very careful with the PR and with everything that's going on out there because it's about religious liberty. You know what, if a woman wants to engage in elective sterilization procedure, purchase contraception, or any of the other drugs, even abortifacient drugs, she's not a bad person, and we can't treat her like that. And that's not what it's about. And we can't let people perceive that. But that doesn't mean that we give up and get rid of what is important to us, you know. The Catholic Church has to be allowed to practice its faith in order to change people's hearts and minds on those issues, right? And we can't demonize it. And we don't like it when it happens to us. So here we go, it gets called a war on women and people back down. Where's the pushback? Where's the people saying, no, we love women. We want women to be in a situation where they don't have to make a decision where they alter their body permanently. I mean, let's look at that, sterilization. That's what the Catholic Church is saying, right? Your body's a gift from God. You don't have to alter your body permanently, right? And no one's saying that. They're backing down, right? They're backing out of the fight. Well, can I, let me just finish, and we'll open it up. I, 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 let me just, I got a couple, I got, I'm actually at the end, so, we're, we're, you know, and then whatever, whatever you want. Why do we have to say something is Catholics? Well, it's in the Catechism, right? The Catechism talks about Participation in the social society is voluntary and generous engagement of a person in a social interchange. It is necessary that all participate, each according to his own position and role, in promoting the common good, right? This obligation is inherent in the dignity of the person. Now, Catechism 1915 states, as far as possible, citizens should take an active part in public life. The manner of this participation may vary from one country or culture to another. One must pay tribute to those nations or systems who permit the largest po uh, possible number of citizens to take part in the public life. But the Catechism is saying you've got to participate in it. Pope Benedict made this clear in Davis Caritas in his first encyclical. He said the direct duty to work for a just ordering of society is proper to the lay faithful. As citizens of the state, they are called to take part in the public life in a personal capacity. So, how do we go forward as Catholics? Well, <coughs> look at what Cardinal Dolan's doing. You want, to, you want to figure out what to do, look at what Cardinal Dolan's doing. He issued a statement, and I just want to read a portion of it, where he says, the Catholic Church defends religious liberty. So remember, someone tells you this is a war on women, they're wrong, and don't put up with it, right? This is about liberty. This is about a church being able to practice its beliefs. This is about a business saying, I don't want to pay for these things because it violates my conscience. And this is what Dolan said. He said, the Catholic Church defends religious liberty, including freedom of conscience for everyone. The Amish do not carry health insurance, and the government respects their principles. Christian scientists want to heal by prayer alone, and the new health care reform law respects that. Quakers and others objecting to killing even in wartime, the government respects that principle by providing conscientious objectors. By its decision, the Obama administration has failed to show the same respect for the consciences of Catholics and others who object to treating pregnancy as a disease. Cardinal Dolan lays it out right there. And we look at this, and we talk about going forward, and we see all these things, the big thing that we have to do is, number one, is to get educated about what's going on. Read wherever we can. Find good websites that will teach us about what's going on so we know how we can combat this stuff, right? And to accept the fact that we can make a difference. By going out and standing up for what we believe, we can change the world. And that's not hokey. It sounds hokey, but it's not. Look at the Newland family. They're challenging this law. And if this regulation gets overturned, it will be because they have the courage to stand up and say, no, we won't be like everyone else. So when we look at everything, how we got here, how it happened, and where we're going, this law represents a significant challenge to all of us in terms of who are we? 
What do we want to do? First, as Catholics, I was at Youth 2000 and Father Harold of the CFR said that we no longer have the luxury of being mediocre Christians. Okay? And Cardinal George, I don't know if any of you know Cardinal George, Cardinal George said, I expect to die in my bed. My successor will die in prison, and his successor will die a martyr in the public square. So the time period to come where it's going to be really tough to practice your faith is upon us. And that's all this is about. This isn't about telling anyone how to live their lives, how to live their bedroom, how to live their reproductive rights. It's not about calling people names, calling people evil or bad people. It's saying we as a church want to, want to answer the call to how we want to practice ourselves. So we have to remember, when it comes to making those changes, just as Roberts told us, it's not our job to protect the people from the consequences of their political choices. We have to get involved in politics. We have to vote. We have to be informed. We have to change things from within. Okay? When we look at the decision itself, it's good. It kind of pulls government power back, but the law is still there. And going forward, we have to understand that challenges are about to come. So if we look at our polling numbers, and if we look at our presence and what we can possibly do, we have the power to make a huge effect. We have the power to go out there and make a difference, right? And if we don't push ourselves beyond our comfort zones, and if we don't stand up for the truth, you know what's going to happen? We're just going to wind up with the consequences of our political choices. So thank you very much for inviting me here. I will work on it.